I haven't touched this topic in a while, and I think it it is worth going back to from time to time, and that is self-advocacy. And there are different kinds of self-advocacy in different environments, in different circumstances. And the first one I want to tackle is the medical self-advocacy. All of us have to go to the doctor for one reason or the other, um, whether we're in a wheelchair or not. But as, as wheelchair users, we have to go because um, we have other, other issues going on, you know, aside from using a wheelchair. This becomes complicated because sometimes you go by yourself. And if you go by yourself, you know you have to speak up and you have to give your information and you have to talk to the doctors, all that kind of stuff. But some of us go with other people with us. And those people sometimes try to speak for us. And that becomes a problem. <laughs> It becomes a problem because people put you aside, don't hear your voice, don't hear what you really hope for and need. They're listening to the other person. So then the problem becomes that the doctor listens to that person, they establish a relationship with that person, and you don't exist. Huh. And you don't want that either. You need to exist. You need, you need a voice. And, and granted, sometimes there are medical circumstances in which someone does have to speak to you or speak for you, sorry, because some voice problem or, you know, some cognitive issues, whatever. I, you know, this is a complicated topic, even though it's self-advocacy. You'd say, oh, that's, I know that. But it's not. And when it comes to the medical field, things come and go so fast for us, either medications or therapy or another surgery, whatever it is, and it comes so fast that we're not able to, you know, to slam on the brakes and, and say, wait a minute. Doc, can you explain that a little bit more to, for me? I didn't get it. I'm not sure I'm going to remember everything, you know, that kind of thing. Now, I've made it clear with the nurses that I work with that I want to speak for myself, and I want the doctors to look at me <laughs> and establish that relationship with me. Um, I, I don't want them giving reports because that's not what the medical appointment is for. It's for the doctor to connect with the patient and establish a, a plan of care for that day or to follow up on a plan of care for, for you know, the month. So, and for that, they need your voice. And sometimes you'll say, geez, <laughs> I never thought of that. Or my partner speaks for me. But the problem is that the relationship gets established with your partner, not with you. And that's who the doctor needs to hear from. Because it's like, how are you feeling on the medication? <laughs> really, truly. And, and there are aspects that, that really need to be addressed. And it needs to come from within you, from that heart, and say, no. This medication is driving me crazy. So it, you don't have to go with the first medication. You don't have to go with the treatment that the doctor is going to impose on you. You can say, no, <laughs> I'm too scared of that, or I prefer to go with the second option. But it, it should come from you. It really should. Now, I'm using a lot of shoulds here, but... But think about it. This is about your care. This is about your voice. So the doctor knows and gets to know, and the nurses get to know what you prefer. They get to know your feelings. They get to know your pain, your physical pain. 
as a person, not as someone who is sitting in a wheelchair and someone else speaks for you. That's not who they should see. They should see Carlos. They should see Peter. They should see John. They should see Mary. And they should know Mary's voice. And they should know John's voice. And they should know Carlos's voice. And, and, and hear the pain. Hear the frustration. So that's self-advocacy. When you express yourself your thoughts, your feelings to the doctor and no one else. So that's, that's self-advocacy. Self-advocacy is also to say, um, you know, I thought about the surgery and I want to delay it because there's XYZ activity coming up in my family and I want to do that before I want to delay the surgery for me to do the surgery after this event, whether it's a baptism or a marriage or finish building a house or whatever it might be. But for you to be in charge, for you to feel like you are steering the, the, the treatment plan, not your partner or your friend or another nurse or, uh, no, uh, I think it's really important for the doctors, nurses, aides to hear your voice, to know your voice. And, and for, n for it not to be, you know, just nodding or this or no. <laughs> You have rights and you have responsibilities at the doctor's office, no matter what doctor it is. So uh, I get it. It's intimidating because sometimes they're talking about things that are hard to understand. They're throwing terms at you that you don't understand, and that's okay. That's where self-advocacy comes in like a knife. because You have to say, Doc, I did not understand that. Can you repeat that? Slow down. I didn't hear you. I'm not clear on what you just said. Why am I doing therapy again? There's no progress from the last time. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and the doctor might say, well, we scheduled six appointments. You only came to three. That's why. <laughs> so. So that, that honesty has to flow, and that self-advocacy. Sometimes we want to fool ourselves, and the doctor will always keep us real. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's, that's, that's why it's important. That's why it's important to really have your voice on the table, not someone else, because someone else might interpret who you are, not exactly how you were expecting. So this is, this is really important, folks. To self-advocacy is speaking up for yourself, is making choices, is speaking up when you don't understand. And it's OK if you didn't understand. It doesn't mean you're less of a person or you're dumb. It just means. You didn't understand the medical terms that they were using. And it's not fair when they do that because the patient needs to be as involved as, in, as possible. And if they don't get it, if they don't understand a particular term, then that the doctor has to change it or show something on the wall. I don't care what it is, but it's so important for the patient to understand what is being said. That is self-advocacy in the medical field. It is hard. It is hard, folks. The other day I had a nurse practitioner that came to see me and we were talking about, you know, certain things that hadn't been looked at yet. And she said, well, we'll do an x-ray and then we'll do an MRI and then 
<laughs> I started chuckling, and I said, because you can do it with a laugh. I said, we, we can't do the MRI because I have cochlear implants. Oh, geez. <laughs> so, and I explained to her what it takes to do an MRI on me and how complicated it is. So, so she said, well, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> so, you know, she has to make, as a nurse practitioner, she has to make the best decision and the, bring to me the best information she has in the next visit. So, you know, it's not a worry. She knows now the complication. She wants the MRI, but it's, it's too complicated. So I said, you can do a CT. <laughs> it's the best we can do. So, of course, I don't get to make those offers. <laughs> the, the doctors do, and, and they can say, we got the message about the MRI issue, so we will do a CT and see what comes of it. And then I feel safe. Then I know I don't have to go through another cotton picking surgery to do an MRI. <laughs> so, um, but those are the moments I need to speak up because otherwise if I say, uh, I just nod my head and say, okay, yeah, we'll do an MRI. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I know we cannot do an MRI just to do an MRI. So, because then the, the neurology department is involved and then my EN, an ENT surgeon has to be involved and it gets complicated, folks. And I can't let that happen. I have to keep it simple. You knew the rest of the sentence. <laughs> so that's why it's important for me to, to voice what we can and cannot do with this poor body of mine. <laughs> so self-advocacy, how, how do you practice self-advocacy in the medical field and where are you struggling right now? Because you can say to the nurse or to the aide, I struggle with self-advocacy in this area. How do we improve that? Because the doctor is going too fast. The doctor is using terms I don't understand. I need your help in X, Y, Z area. That's self-advocacy. You got to speak up for what's going on within you. And it's hard. And it's not easy. <laughs> Especially after an accident, perhaps, or an illness that you were not always in the mood to, to be at the doctor's office. It, the, the date is a date, and that's it. And sometimes we might not feel like we want to be there, <laughs> truly. <laughs> you know, because you know what you have gonna, you're going to have to talk about again, and why you're not walking, when you will not walk, um, you know, the day, you know, it, that you'll never walk again. However, you know, you can improve X, Y, Z. Um, so, or you will walk, but very limited, and then, you know, you can't overextend yourself, you know, all those kind of si those things, and if I don't overextend myself, then how do I do this? How do I do life? So, I want to ride a horse again. How do I do that? So, Self-advocacy, speaking up for yourself, for the, for the doctor to know your voice, your needs, your pain, your frustrations. So that is self-advocacy in the medical field. It is not easy. It requires practice. It requires an agreement with your partner, or your friend, or the nurse who comes with you to these appointments. So that dialogue has to happen. And for you to explain how important it is for your voice to be known in the office. So I just wanted to say that, you know, you rule. As a patient, you rule in the doctor's office. You do. This is your appointment. 
So they can't do anything to you unless you say yes. So I wanted to say that because for some of us, it's very hard to go to all these appointments. And it's really hard, you know, when we have a doctor who we don't get along with. And, and sometimes we have to say it. We're not getting along. So how do we... How do we work this out? So, and I had a doctor. He was absolutely crazy, a looney tune. He was m with had mental health issues, and I had to deal with them in, in the hospital. And I was in a situation where I couldn't get up and walk away. <laughs> I I was just bedridden, and he had the run of the of the room. He was a dangerous man. And that is an awful feeling, to be in the hospital, not being able to move, and you have this crazy looney tune going at you, insulting you, putting you down, threatening you, playing horrible games with you. So, you know, I had to run to the head nurse and say, this doctor can't touch me. <laughs> I don't know who he is or where or where he came from, but he cannot continue to treat me. He is crazy. <laughs> so in a couple of different patients it said the same thing. So so I was in good company. But you know, when you feel like, you know, things are a little dangerous, you, you really have to say something. Um this doctor was going to see me again in outpatient when I got out of the hospital. And I said immediately at the front desk, I said, he may not come in the room by himself. A nurse or another doctor has to come in with him. And the nurse at the front desk looked at me and she said, you're serious? And I said, absolutely. I've had enough of him. So... That's what they did because I asked it for it. And this doctor was not happy, but he was very limited <laughs> at that point. He couldn't insult me or put me down or try to scare me. Um, he couldn't do any of those things anymore. So, um, and then before I knew it, they assigned uh, a doctor to him. And that's what happens when uh, a physician is being assessed, when the physician's abilities are being evaluated, they assign another doctor to work side by side with them. And then that doctor has to report what they saw, what they heard. So it was serious, but my health was, was on the line. My sanity, this guy was nuts. So that was really important. It, I would have wished I had somebody with me at that time. I would have wished I had a nurse with me when I was working with this Looney Tune um, because it was insane. Um, I couldn't believe the things the doctor was telling me that he was going to do to me. And it would come out of the blue. He would be very nice for the first 10, 15 minutes. Then all of a sudden, it was Jekyll and Hyde. And Hyde would come out. And I was like, well, where did the doctor go? <laughs> and then when the threat started, I'd be like, when did you start that? <laughs> Why do you think that's a method in, in the medical field? You know, and then he, he would really verbally attacked me, verbally threatened me. It was unbelievable. It never happened to me ever in my hospital. So he was uh, gently retired <laughs> um, and is no longer there. So so I don't, I don't have to be nervous or afraid, you know, for the next therapist or the chief of therapy, you know, working with me. So, um, but it was, it was, it was really hard, folks, and I don't wish that on anyone, and I'm hoping that 
none of you have any kind of doctor like that. But if you do, you can, you can quit seeing that person and just say, I refuse to see XYZ doctor or I refuse to work with XYZ nurse. So if that is ever happening to any one of you. So self-advocacy is hard. Self-advocacy takes practice. And self-advocacy takes a lot of talking to yourself in the mirror and to see if you can improve each appointment when you go. And so that is my invitation to each one of you that you practice self-advocacy in the medical field so that you get the treatment and the services that you need.